Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's National Conference of State Legislature's webinar, Wheels in Motion, the VW Settlement. My name is Kristen Hildreth, Policy Specialist for NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee, and I'll be your moderator for today. This is the second webinar in the committee's 2018 Spring Webinar Series. We have three more scheduled over the course of the next month um, on a variety of topics, including community solar energy policies, rebuilding before and after a natural disaster, and the latest on federal infrastructure funding. For a complete schedule and registration details, please visit our website at www.ncsl.org. Back to our focus today. Before I introduce our speakers, though, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items. Our webinar is being recorded, and registrants will be able to access a recording of the webinar in presentation slides on NCSL's website. We'll send out an email notice shortly with a link to these resources. Additionally, you can download the slides being used today by clicking on the library icon in the upper right portion of your screen. And of course, please feel free to submit any question at any time by typing it into the chat box on the left. We will hold Q&A after our speakers finish presenting. But again, if you have any questions, please make sure to type them into that chat box. Why we're here today. With $2.7 billion up for grabs for beneficiaries to Volkswagen AG settlement with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, we're going to look at how beneficiaries are looking to spend their pot of gold. During this hour, we'll explore the settlement, review a host of projects that reduce nitrogen oxide emissions from the transportation sector, and see how a few states' beneficiary plans are shaping up. Joining us today are four speakers. Cassie Powers from the National Association of State Energy Officials, Christine Hoffler from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, Senator Michael Dembrow uh, from the 23rd Senate District in Oregon, and Kevin Downing from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. First up, we have Cassie Powers, Senior Program Director at the National Association of State Energy Officials. Cassie leads in Zayo's transportation and state energy planning programs for writing research, <laughs> analysis, and facilitation support for state energy offices on transportation and clean energy issues, and also acts as a resource on federal transportation policy for the state. She holds a master's degree in urban and environmental planning from the University of Virginia and a Bachelor of Arts from the College of William & Mary. Cassie will provide us with an overview of the settlement. Cassie, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is now yours. Thanks, Kristen, and hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am Cassie Powers with the National Association of State Energy Officials, or NASIO. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to do a really quick About Us slide for those who aren't familiar with our work. Um, NASIO is the membership organization for the governor-designated energy offices in each of the states and territories. We facilitate peer learning amongst the state energy offices, um, serve as an advocate for state energy offices and issues of interest, provide research and facilitation support across a number of energy issues, and also act as a liaison between the state energy offices and the federal departments of energy. And of difference, in, in addition, we hold convening services as conferences and events. So I've been asked today to provide an overview of the settlement between EPA and Volkswagen. So a couple years ago, Volkswagen agreed to spend up to $14.9 billion, with a B, dollars to settle allegations of cheating emissions. And the settlement funds will be to buy back and or modify the vehicles and support national and state level projects to reduce NOx emissions. So as you can see from the pie chart on this slide, about $10 billion of that initial settlement went to the vehicle buyback and modification program. That went to consumers who had purchased the affected diesel vehicle. Another $2 billion, that gray wedge, went into a zero emission vehicle investment program. Um, what that has become in practice is um, that Volkswagen has created a subsidiary, Electrify America, which is a for-profit company, to administer the zero emission vehicle investment plan. So they will be investing $2 billion with a B dollars in infrastructure um, across the United States over the next 10 years. The portion of the settlement that I'm going to focus on today, though, is the $2.9 billion that has been placed into an environmental mitigation trust. 
And so the $2.9 billion has been placed into the trust and is, has been allocated to beneficiaries, which includes states, tribes, and certain territories, based on the number of impacted vehicles in their jurisdictions. Um, the trust is going to support projects that reduce NOx emissions where the vehicles will have been operated. So you can see on this chart with very tiny font <laughs> the breakdown of how much money each state is receiving from the Environmental Mitigation Trust. Um, and just to note that, of course, these slides will be available afterwards, and so you'll be able to take a closer look at that, at that then. I wanted to provide a few notes on what the money can be used for. And so the, um, the money, as I mentioned, has been placed into the Environmental Mitigation Trust, which is administered by a group called the Wilmington Trust. And they are really the financial institution that is keeping track of the funds. Each of the states have then been designated as a beneficiary of the trust and will receive their allocation of that amount. So they'll be working with the Wilmington Trust to withdraw funds. Importantly, money from the states can only be spent on 10 very specific eligible action areas which are listed here. It includes large trucks, medium trucks, buses, freight switchers, ferries and tugs, ocean-going vessels or shore power, airport ground support equipment, forklifts, light duty ZEV supply equipment, otherwise known as EV charging stations or hydrogen fueling stations, as well as a tenth option, which is any project that's covered under the HADIRA Act. This is just important to note because there's been some discussion that states will be able to use this money for other purposes. However, the trust will not release this money unless it is specifically used for a project to support any of these ten eligible actions. Another important note is that the purpose of the trust is to reduce the amount of NOx emissions from the transportation sector. And in that light, the vehicles that can be purchased within these 10 categories must be clean vehicles. And so the types of fuels that are eligible for the replacement vehicles include clean diesel, um, natural gas, propane and electricity. And so, for example, a state can then can retire an old school bus that runs on diesel and replace it with a new school bus that runs on any of those clean fuel types. A couple of other notes I just want to make on the eligible actions is that um, states can really decide how much money they want to put to any, in, into any one of these categories. They can spread it out between all ten categories. They can focus it entirely on one. That's up to each state. Um, the one um, exception to that is that under the charging station category, um, the states can only spend up to 15% of their allocation on EV chargers for light duty vehicles. One thing I wanted to also mention is that states across the country are in the process of developing their beneficiary mitigation plan. So this is a high-level plan that summarizes how the funds for that state are going to be spent. There are a number of things the plan should address, including the overall goal for the use of the funds, the categories of eligible action areas, how the proposed action areas will impact air quality, and the expected range of emissions benefits. Um, one thing to note is that these plans are coming out now. However, beneficiaries can adjust their goals and spending at any time. They just need to send an update to the trust. States also need to provide opportunities for the public to provide input on how the Environmental Mitigation Trust funds can be spent, in essence, to comment on the plan. And so states across the country are hosting um, essentially different types of forums and listening opportunities for states to learn, excuse me, for stakeholders to learn about how the state intends to use their funds and provide feedback. A quick update on where we are now. So this is a timeline that basically takes us from when the settlement first became effective in October of 16 all the way up until now. In essence, each state has designated a lead agency who will serve as the administrator of the funds. Um, those lead agencies in most states are the environment or air agencies. In about either eight to ten states, it is the energy office that serves as leads. And in a number of states, it's an, a different office, such as the DOT, Department of Administration, et cetera. States, as I mentioned, right now are in the process of finalizing their, fun, their, the, finalizing their plans, and once those are finalized, they will be able to apply to the trustee to withdraw funds, which means that the earliest funding available is the spring of this year. 
I do just want to give a little bit more detail too on where states are. Um, I won't go into too much information or detail on any one state since I know that our great speakers that are following me are going to cover that for, um, for the states in question. But just to note um, that as I mentioned, the lead agencies in all of the states have been designated. Those lead agencies will be the ones who are in charge of developing programs, administering the funds for their states, and developing and implementing the beneficiary mitigation plan. States have also launched websites and stakeholder engagement types of sessions to receive public comment. Um, about 30 plans have either been drafted or finalized to date, but that changes almost every day. These, these are, are coming out fast now. There are some trends we've been seeing across the different plans. Most of the plans that we've been seeing in the states are committing to some, at least some portion of funding to EV charging stations, or, or EVSE. About half the plans include a goal of supporting the adoption of zero emission vehicles in one of the categories or generally, and school buses have also been identified as a priority in the majority of plans. Interestingly, most plans also leave room for investment in any of the eligible mitigation action categories, which again are 10 specific action categories. And then few plans actually commit to specific fuels. So a lot of states are saying that we want to set up a program, for example, in school buses, but we're open to any type of fuel. This is also just some highlights from a few plans to see kind of how states are thinking about breaking down their funding. Um, as you can see um, in Pennsylvania, for example, there will be an allocation for on-road fleet projects, off-road fleet projects, small category for DERA, and Pennsylvania, for example, is planning on spending the maximum of 15% on EV charging stations. Um, you can see from some of these, such as Pennsylvania, two states are leaving some, some room so that they can, um, they can essentially spend different amounts of money in different categories and also are leaving it pretty high, high level. Um, one of the things I do want to note also is that the state agencies um, are allowed to recoup up to 15% of their total allocation for administrative expenditures. Some states are choosing to recap or at least leave the option of recouping the total of 15%. Others are saying they are planning on recouping um, less than that for administrative ex expenses. For example, as you can see here, the District of Columbia is proposing that only 9% of the total funds be used for administration. This is something that's just important to note because one thing that I did not mention at the beginning, but the Environmental Trust has a lifespan of 10 to 15 years. And so states can either choose to spend all of their allocated amount of money in the first three years, or they can stretch it out over a 10 to 15 year period. So that's just a note on the timing. I also just wanted to mention before I leave, and it looks like my animation didn't quite come through here, but we do have a website that's available that might be an interesting resource to learn more about the settlement as well as the different projects that are eligible for funding. The Clearinghouse is a collaborative project of NASIO as well as the National Association of Clean Air Agencies, or NACA. You can go to the website listed here to learn more about the settlement, see breakdown of funding by state, learn more about the different admissions tools that states may use to calculate um, the NOx reductions from the proposed projects, as well as just learn more about alternative fuels in general. We'll continue to update this site um, as the project evolves. One other thing I just wanted to mention is that the lead agencies in most states do participate in a VW working group that's hosted by NASIO and NACA. This is a group that meets by phone once a month so that states can exchange information and share best practices as well as just raise administrative and programmatic questions with, with one another. So this is all just to say that um, the, the lead agencies as well as our members, the state energy offices and the air agencies have been engaged in peer exchange learning from one another and are working to make the best use of the funds. I believe that that brings me to the end, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. Very helpful and informative and <clears throat> great in setting up um, our next couple of speakers. So our second speaker today is Christine Hustler. She's the coordinator for the Small Business Assistance Program with the Air Pollution Control Division at Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment. She has over 17 years of diverse experience in environmental health and public health issues, including air quality, indoor air quality, and hazardous waste. She has a BS in environmental science from the Metropolitan State University of Denver. As Colorado is ahead of many states <coughs> in their process, 
Um, Christine will provide an overview of their beneficiary and mitigation plan, the public process, and their actions chosen. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is now yours. Great. Thank you very much. And let me know if you can't hear me well. Um, so good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. Again, I'm with the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and we were designated as the state's lead agency to oversee the funds for Colorado. And Colorado is um, slated to initially get uh, $68.7 of the settlement funds. So back in 2016, the department decided to partner with our Colorado Department of Transportation, our Colorado Energy Office, and our Regional Air Quality Council to help us develop our public outreach and actually develop our mitigation plan. So I'm going to just be going over the process that we went through and our actual plan at the end. Um, our public comment process started back in 2016. Um, we initially had our first um, public comment meeting on November 7th, 2016. And out of that, we received about 90 comments on how we should spend the funds. We um, worked throughout 2017 with um, our partner agencies and did individual stakeholder meetings, um, organizational meetings, and um, out of that we had about 15 public presentations um, in regards to the settlement. The next step we took was to actually draft our mitigation plan and we released our draft plan on August 28th of last year for public comment. We had a second public comment meeting on September 18th, and then the deadline for the public comment was October, uh, October 13th. We took all the comments into consideration and made appropriate revisions to finalize our beneficiary mitigation plan. And then on March 21st of this year, we submitted the plan to the trust. Oops. So some of the uh, comments we received, um, we had a high degree of interest from government entities and the public. We received comments on a wide variety of topics, but several themes emerged and Mostly we, see, we saw a theme of um, everyone was supportive of electric vehicle um, infrastructure and electric vehicle replacement. Out of those comments, we received um, about 2,100 citizen group, kind of grouped email or comments um, for electric vehicles. And then also, you know, we got regular citizen comments, um, government comments, and then businesses were also commenting. Out of the comments also, they were very supportive of how we um, are going to allocate the funds within our plan. Some of the significant comments we had to our plan, um, talked about eligibility issues. Uh, people wanted us to define more what we meant by airport ground support equipment and how we were going to fund um, freight switchers and other types of fuels, so we addressed that. And they were concerned with our incentive levels. In our plan, we did not allow for the 100% for the public funding. We dropped our percentages down to 20% for private and then 40% incentive levels for public entities. And I'll go over more of our plan in a couple minutes. Um, we also got comments on expanding the DARA option. So looking at the DARA option, it allows us to fund construction equipment at mining sites and possibly uh, funding oil and gas drill rigs, switching those from diesel to natural gas. Also we, in our plan, we had a fleet size requirement of nine vehicles or less for small businesses to switch from 
diesel vehicles to non to clean diesels. Um, in our plan, we were trying to promote more electric vehicles, but people were having issues with the fleet sizing. So we also changed that in our plan. And one of the biggest comments we received was the scrappage requirement for all the vehicles um, being accepted into this. And as we all know, that's a requirement of the trust, and we cannot change that part of our plan. Some other updates I had to make to our plan was to clarify what we meant by disproportionate areas um, versus environmental health or equity and environmental justice areas. Uh, people were concerned that these areas were going to be the only areas that were going to receive funding. And we wanted to make sure that the funding was available throughout the state because those vehicles were sold throughout the state. But um, mostly, we had to make sure that there was a difference between disproportionate areas in our environmental justice areas. So overall, um, we're assuming that um, these funds will be taken up in environmental justice areas, and we'll just be doing more outreach to those areas. We also had to clarify our transit bus eligibility. Um, in the trust, it allows for alternative fuel, so we wanted to make sure that people knew that also meant electric vehicles, uh, electric buses. Our zero emission vehicle infrastructure numbers, we had initially had incentives to replace about 30 to 40 um, of those vehicles on our major corridors. And sorry, this is looking like it's going to disconnect, and it just did. Um, so my thing just just disconnected, <laughs> so I can't see my my presentation any longer. So I'll just continue without the presentation. Um, so with that, we made some changes to our plan, and then updated our BMP. So our BMP uh, mitigation plan, we developed specific projects that we're looking at, and those are, um, we're going to put in $18 million to replace approximately 400 to 450 medium and heavy duty trucks, school buses and shuttle buses. And that program will include the freight switchers and airport ground support equipment. So we're going to be using our existing infrastructure through Alt Fuels Colorado, which is ran through the Regional Air Quality Council, to replace those. And then also we have um, a project for transit bus replacement, where they'll be receiving $18 million to replace Class 4 through 8 transit buses with alternative fuel or electric vehicle, uh, bus vehicles. And this will be done through our CDOT, um, Colorado Department of Transportation. And then we're also going to allow for the DARA program. Uh, we're putting $5 million into that program. And we are also going to be using the full 15% of zero emission vehicle equipment. Out of all of that, we also slated for $5.7 million for implementation of running these programs. Um, we estimated what it would cost to run these programs based upon how they are currently ran. And our governor actually asked us to keep those funds as low as possible. So we had to adjust those funds throughout the year to include some costs we hadn't thought of. But initially, we had had $5 million set aside for admin costs, and now we're looking at $5.7 million to do outreach, solicit and review applications, and then verify projects. And the last portion of our mitigation plan includes $11.7 million in a fund that we're calling flex funds. Um, that fund is set aside to respond to program uptake and then also based upon technologies. If we're seeing a different technology come out, we will go back and actually you know, 
put that money into that or change our mitigation plan. So with that, that's basically the overall plan for Colorado. So sorry about the slides. Um, hopefully you could still see those on your end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Sorry that disconnected, but yes, the, the slides were definitely visible for participants. Oh. <clears throat> so let's move on to our last set of speakers. Um, as Oregon's legislature had a significant role in determining settlement projects, we're joined by a duo from the state to discuss actions taken. Um, we're joined by State Senator Michael Denbrow of Oregon and Kevin Downing of Oregon's Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, Senator Denbrow serves Senate District 23, which includes portions of Portland and the city of Maywood Park. He was first elected to the House in 2008 and was appointed to the Senate in 2013 re-elected in 2014 and 2016. He serves as a chair of the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Committee and is a retired English instructor and has served on the state's Board of Education. Michael earned his undergraduate degree in English from the University of Connecticut and his master's degree in comparative literature from Indiana University. Kevin Downing has worked for the Department of Environmental Quality since 1992 and since 2000 he has worked as Oregon's Clean Diesel Program Coordinator. The program provides financial and technical assistance to reduce health and environmental effects from exposure to diesel exhaust, a multi-billion dollar issue in Oregon. Over the last 15 years, he has been able to deliver cost-effective projects showing sizable social returns on investment. Senator Denbrow and Kevin, it's great to have you with us. The floor is not yours. Thanks very much. This is Kevin Downing. Uh, and this is Michael Denbrow. Uh, and Kevin, you're going to start us off, right? Right. Yes. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is talk a story about how um, the, the agencies have worked together with the legislature on this program and actually reflects kind of a history of engagement um, for many years around the issue of diesel emissions and, and how that has folded into our response to the availability of the Volkswagen uh, funds. So as Cassie had outlined earlier, there's a multi-billion dollar judgment available here. There's the three elements, the relief for the vehicle owners, the ZEV infrastructure fund. But the ones, of course, that we're most interested here today is about the environmental mitigation fund. And in the decree, there was no, uh, the role was an outline for the executive branch. The governor uh, was to designate a lead agency, and then from there, the governor um, would designate other actors who would be able to uh, develop the plans and to receive the funds and expend the funds, but there was no identified role for the legislative branch in in the decree, uh, which would be seem anomalous given that it was not just uh, singular action by one uh, branch of government to work on these kinds of issues. Um. Right, and here in Oregon, uh, the legislature, you know, really plays a vigorous role in overseeing our executive uh, agencies. Uh, you know, we approve budgets uh, through policy. We help set uh, direction for the agencies. And, uh, you know, both through our uh, policy committees uh, in each chamber and our appropriations committee, which, you know, in Oregon, it's a joint House-Senate appropriations committee, uh, we, uh, you know, once once the word came down about the settlement, it, it was clear that the legislature would need to be involved in the design of the plan here in Oregon. So, and then the other piece that is a player in in the normal processing work for the Department of Environmental Quality is a five-member citizen panel appointed by the governor, known here as the Environmental Quality Commission, and they have policy and rulemaking authority for the department. They also oversee the budget uh, for the department uh, and, and hire the director. So they have a very central role, but of course the decree didn't talk about that or how that might play into this. And it's not a, not a slam on the decree. You have to recognize that that was a document that was written to cover 50 states, the Puerto Rico and uh, the District of Columbia. So a diverse set of government structures uh, was how the decree was meant to cover but still there are these elements that the states themselves have to figure out how they come into play 
as they proceed forward with their plan. And so in Oregon, uh, the, the Environmental Mitigation Fund, as Cassie's had said, is allocated by a vehicle registration share. And Oregon had the unique and perhaps, well, I think it's honorable in a way that we had the highest per capita registration of diesel passenger, Volkswagen diesel passenger cars in the country. And frankly, the way I explain that is that Oregonians were looking for a car that would have good power, great fuel economy, not stink, and, and, and have a minor impact on the environment. And that's, I think, why the diesels were such an attractive option for here. Uh, and, and so we end up with about $73 million and 46 cents that uh, we get to spend on environmental mitigation projects to offset the excess and uh, existing uh, NOx emissions from, motor, uh, from these diesel cars. So the governor has designated DEQ as the implementing agency, and because of the history of working on this issue for a long time, our focus has really been on reducing diesel emission primarily. This is a map of the state that by our analysis indicates those counties where people living there uh, experience an excess risk from cancer from exposure to uh, the exhaust and diesel engines that operate in those locations. Um, as Kathy had said too, the focus of the, of the fund is to reduce NOx emissions from uh, diesel engines. Our concern is primarily around PM emissions, but fortuitously the strategies that we're talking about here will do both simultaneously. So in 2000, uh, we began the Oregon Clean Diesel Initiative, which was this voluntary uh, program to help, uh, to help people reduce the emissions from their so-called legacy from in-use engines um, through either um, primarily technical assistance or financial assistance to help people change over to lower emitting fuels or lower emitting engines or improving their practices so they're idling less, for instance, they're operating more efficiently and still getting the same work done, all these kinds of things we're out there promoting. In 2007, the legislature passed House Bill 2172, which authorized the Clean Diesel Engine Fund. And this will be uh, the part uh, later on we'll see about how that fits into the Volkswagen settlement piece. Um, this was actually a general fund appropriation at the time where we would use the money to support retrofitting and repowering of older diesel engines. And the legislature also provided tax credits at that time also to uh, support retrofitting and repowering. Um, and actually, the timing on this was such that we got about a year and a half into the program when the recession hit, and like many other states, we had to, the legislature had to readjust the budgets, and monies that we didn't have spent uh, reverted back to the general fund and the tax credit program, which effectively is a draw on general fund expenditures, also disappeared at that point, too. In 2009, the, the next action relevant here was in House Bill 2795, where the legislature set deadlines for school districts to operate uh, post-2007 buses by 2025, either by retrofitting the buses or by replacing them with uh, newer, lower emission buses, either diesel, propane, electricity, natural gas. Yeah, uh, so let me take over. Um, the uh, you know, by uh, 2014, uh, I was, uh, you know, first appointed into the Senate, chaired the Environment and Natural Resources Committee, and started working with DEQ on the diesel issue. Uh, and we took their best thinking at the time of how we could mitigate the problem and came up with Senate Bill 824, uh, which didn't pass, but, you know, generated hearings and led to uh, a work group then in 2016, which was uh, very broad in its stakeholders and really very useful. We had legislators and local government electives, public health advocates, agencies, uh, trucking and construction and ad uh, and forestry industry representatives, environmentalists, environmental justice uh, advocates, and researchers on the, um, the, the issues related to diesel. And we really came to understand the enormity of the problem, you know, which you may not think about it. You know, when most people think of the state of Oregon, they think of a state that is, you know, green and, you know, very natural. Uh, and you know, largely that is true. Uh, but um, in parts of the state, especially here in the Portland metro area, 
Uh, diesel is a problem uh, through a combination of interstates and uh, construction that's going on uh, and just, uh, you know, our geography. Uh, so we came to understand that. Um, but, uh, you know, we also came to understand, uh, you know, the difficulty of mitigating the problem. Our state to the south, California, has made great strides, uh, but they've had access to funding streams uh, that, you know, we don't have here in Oregon, and really there's no prospect for having. Uh, so while we wanted to try to create a kind of carrot and stick approach where we could uh, come up with regulation but provide industry with the ability to, uh, to transition into newer vehicles or cleaner fuel sources, uh, that, that face, that, that, you know, we faced a real challenge there. As it happened, while the work group was meeting, uh, the word about the settlement came down. And we uh, knew that we were going to have at least one tool uh, to work with. Um, and when we went into session, we drafted an omnibus bill that was uh, a combination of uh, incentives and uh, funding using the uh, the VW settlement uh, and regulation to phase out the dirtier engines. Uh, it was, as you can imagine, very contentious, uh, and we ended up uh, modifying the bill uh, on those areas where we did have consensus. And one of the major areas was around school buses. Uh, it was clear to us that the, the goals that we had set with the legislation that, that uh, Kevin mentioned were not going to be meet, met by our deadline that, you know, by the, uh, uh, the deadline in the 2020s, uh, we were going to be about 450 buses short. Uh, so we agreed in, uh, in the session, in the 2017 session that we would, uh, uh, that, that we would direct VW dollars into uh, the school bus uh, retrofits or replacements, and we would uh, keep the rest of the dollars on hold for further exploration uh, in a future session, uh, so that we could come back and deal with the uh, with the program comprehensively. And that that's where we uh, ended the 2017 session. We we also I will say. Uh, we fund. We did fund not through VW money, but through general fund money, uh, an inventory of our off-road construction equipment. We have a good sense of where we are on on-road uh, because they have to be registered uh, with our Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, but not on off-road. And we wanted to have a better sense of where, you know, how old the construction fleet is where they're located, where they are emitting the most uh, particulates and, and uh, NOx contaminants. So, Kevin. So what, we've, what we did, DEQ, in the planning process, we actually put an initial proposal and outline, we described it, for a plan in the spring of uh, 2017. This is actually in the beginning stages this was it during the middle of the legislative session when this conversation was going on, and quite frankly, was meant to help set the table for further conversations about what would be the best use of the money. As you and many of the states are already uh, struggling with this question about how do you spend this windfall, even within the mitigation actions, there's still a wide range of choices about what represents a good priority or what, what are the criteria for selecting projects, many of which can be competing one to the other. And so what we did is we proposed an outline in 17 where we said that our goals were to, as said on the slide, is to maximize the benefits for vulnerable populations, to actually target those areas of the state that had high diesel emissions to begin with, and to also maximize the bang for the buck, the cost effectiveness, to use those as factors. Um, and, to, and from that, then projects would potentially naturally migrate up from each of those mitigation categories about what would be the optimal uh, uh, project activity to spend money on that would hit those kinds of targets. After the legislature had acted, 
we had our, our outline, as Senator DeDembro had said, which was to spend the money on replacing or upgrading school buses. So we proposed that plan in a public comment process in January of 2018, and it was really to target that towards the school buses because we know, for instance, that this is a sensitive population because of their uh, breathing rate is high relative to the body mass of their their tendency to be exposed to pollutants is more uh, aggravated than for older people. We also know that older diesel buses have a tendency to be self-polluting, and so that levels inside the buses can be high enough to be of concern, so much so that there have been studies that have been published to show that kids traveling on lower emission buses actually experience lower absenteeism rates, so their, uh, their chronic uh, and acute disease uh, exposure goes down. And also the support, frankly, the uh, the fleets, the school bus fleet in the state, which is at this point the only fleet with a uh, statutory target to reduce emissions by 2025. So the next steps now are for uh, once we, so we're in the process of doing that plan. Uh, we expect to complete that over the next four years or so, but then we still have, and that will consume about $18 million or so of the available funding which leaves us still with a substantial amount of money to expend. And so now the next step is really up to the Legislative Assembly. Right. And, you know, it's a substantial amount, uh, but it's, it's both a lot of money and it's not a lot of money in, uh, you know, in solving the, the diesel problem that we face here. Uh, and so we are, as you can imagine, in ongoing discussions and preparation for our 2019 session. Uh, we're not in session right now. Uh, we will come back into session in January. And we're th thinking about the best ways to use those remaining dollars. Um, the governor would like us to uh, spend the full 15% on uh, uh, zero emission infrastructure. And I, I think uh, you know, there is a lot of interest in our doing that. We're also exploring how we can make best use of having uh, our public sector lead by example. And through its public contracting processes, uh, you know, whether it's uh, construction or otherwise, uh, to come up with clean diesel standards, construction standards for its contracting, uh, so that we can make sure that um, the um, the companies, the private sector companies that contract with the state uh, are doing the work with clean fleets. Um, and uh, one of the challenges that local government has faced is they, they also here really want to provide pathways for uh, minority-owned, women-owned, uh, emerging small businesses uh, that, are, that are in the construction uh, or transportation fields uh, but, you know, don't really don't have the wherewithal to convert to the cleaner technologies. And so we're really looking hard at how we can use uh, a, a big chunk of the remaining dollars to help them with that. And we think that that will leverage a, a lot of change in a positive way here. So it's discussions like that that are ongoing with uh, all the stakeholders and local governments um, that we hope to have finalized uh, sometime in the fall. And just to underscore that point about uh, the impact on engines, we think there's maybe 70,000 or more diesel engines operating in Oregon that could be eligible for funding under uh, any of the mitigation categories that are outlined in the decree. Even with $73 million, though, we probably can only touch about 2,000 of those. And so the challenge in this for us and for all the other states is to figure out how to most cost-effectively expend those dollars to make the greatest uh, difference and benefit that we can bring to our citizens. So once the legislature uh, sets those, determines what those categories or priorities are, however narrowly or broadly defined that direction they may give us, then our plan would be to go out and engage the public further in terms of the refining the, the details of the implementation plan, the mitigation plan that would be using those funds, and then to also take them to our Environmental Quality Commission for their consideration and, frankly, approval as well. And after that, of course, submitting the updated plan to the trustee and then begin actual implementation after that. And so with that, I think we're ready for answering any of the questions that people might have. 
Great. Thank you both so much. That was a great review of the legislative and regulatory sides in Oregon and, and really, really set up a good stage for question and answer now. Um, so as we shift gears to the final portion of today's webinar, um, question and answers, the chat box that's open on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, there were two questions already received in there. Um, so if you have any, please do input them. Um, I guess bring up in case people can't see it, uh, two of the ones that were just asked and answered by Cassie, um, can state legislatures receive funding directly and appropriate the funding, or must the lead agency receive funds first? Um, Cassie, I don't know if you want to repeat that or if you want me to go ahead and repeat that answer. Um, sure, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you go. All right, I was going to say, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, and so the lead agencies must request and administer the funding. And so the way the trust is set up is that the lead agencies need to make requests of Wilmington Trust, the financial overseer of the funds. Now, they can either hold the funds within the lead agency themselves, the beneficiary, and distribute it from there, or they can make direct payments to project recipients. But if they do that, the project recipients need to demonstrate that they are replacing or retrofitting a vehicle and provide proper documentation. Okay. Um, and then another one that was included in there was what happens if a state doesn't use their allocated funding? And kind of building off of that a little bit, um, is there a deadline for the states to make use of their full allocated funding? Is there a deadline by which um, states must meet that before leftover funding kind of gets reallocated? What's that process like, Cassie? Sure. And so states have to use 80% of their allocated funds in the first 10 years. Um, and then they have to use the remaining with um, five years after. So basically 100% of the funds have to be used within a 15-year period. Any funds that are not used by the state will be reallocated to the other beneficiaries um, using the same formula that was originally used to establish allocation amounts. Okay. And it looks like states are submitting um, funding requests after they get their beneficiary mitigation um, plan submitted. Is there a deadline for those beneficiary mitigation plans? Um, and if so, when is that? There is not a deadline. And so states need to submit their beneficiary mitigation plans 30 days before they request their first round of funding, but they can wait as long as they'd like to submit those plans. Great. Um, and it looks like Colorado looked into the, the DERA option. Um, I don't know if Christine's back on the line. Um, yeah. Perfect. So what, what percentage of, I guess, Colorado's beneficiary mitigation plan um, uses that DERA funding? And uh, maybe Cassie can jump on this as well. Um, but how does the DERA option work for those eligible beneficiaries? So our portion, we just um, basically said we're going to give five million um, set aside for the DARA, and it's my understanding that those funds can be matched through the DARA program. And uh, Kathy might want to explain that a little bit better than I can. Um, but this, the DARA option, to our understanding, gives you an option out of the mitigation projects to be able to use it for, you know, construction equipment and stuff like that that's not specified as another eligible mitigation action. Let me yeah. take a run at the how the DERA money may, how the DERA uh, act, option may actually work. So uh, states get an allocation from the EPA through DERA and if they match that amount then they get half again more and many states like we in Oregon are now going to be using our VW allotment to make the match. Um, and so that gets additional federal funding awarded into the states. And, and how you may, how a state may fund projects otherwise using the DERA option beyond even that match requirement is to simply write their work plan for the DERA allocation that they get to include whatever that nature of the projects that they're looking to fund. Um, so they could spend basically um, all of their money through DERA option type projects using a work plan uh, communication with EPA, or they could just spend the, the, the amount that meets the state's match. The other thing to keep in mind about the DERA option is that 
it, it depends upon EPA having the DERA program available, which actually uh, depends itself upon Congress appropriating money annually for DERA expenditures. If Congress were to stop funding DERA programs at EPA level, then the DERA option would also disappear as a, utils, as a use of the VW money, too. Right. All right, thanks for that explanation. Um, I guess back to Colin, Oregon, when you were accepting public comments, were there any projects um, that stakeholders were writing back about that they um, weren't pleased about or wish more funding had gone to? Um, for Colorado, we had some issues where we weren't allowing for enough diesel retrofits and um, we actually are not allowing for repowers um, just based upon some experience that our existing programs have had. So we had comments that we, we should allow more um, diesel retrofits in our plan and we didn't really change that with our comments. I would say that the strongest singular interest in terms of commenting on the plan was for many people advocating that um, the, the vehicles that we buy as replacements should never be powered, should not be powered by fossil fuels of any form and should only be spent on electrically powered vehicles. Um, so I think that generally there was very strong interest in that expressed when we had put our initial plan out for public comment. There was not particularly any other categories per se that people uh, wanted to see favored over one or another. Um, yeah, and that is a, a real ch challenge for us. I will, you know, I'll add to what Kevin just said in that, you know, we as you know, we have a strong interest in uh, carbon mitigation here. Uh, but you know, we also have a strong interest in getting the. Uh, you know, the most value out of this program in terms of uh, public health. And, uh, you know, in terms of public health, uh, you know, benefits of a new diesel engine uh, are very, very high. And, you know, at least for now, uh, you know, the costs are, are lower than for an electric uh, vehicle. Uh, so for school buses, for example, we, um, you know, school districts can certainly choose to uh, replace their old buses with an electric bus, uh, but uh, they're going to have to uh, uh, pay for that, the difference in cost themselves. Thank you. Um, and now I look at, I look to North Carolina where there's, there's been some pushback on the legislative involvement. Um, with the settlement. Have you had that in order at all? Uh, no. Uh, you know, I think everyone just here always assumed that the legislature would be playing a, a lead role in this. And, and maybe because, you know, we have been talking about this uh, diesel problem for so long. And it is something that legislators hear a lot about from their constituents, uh, that this mm -hmm. is a problem that needs to be addressed. Thank you. And then, I guess, wrapping up on that, when you were in the drafting of the 2017 bill was going on, were there any major points of contention? Was there any doubt that funds weren't going to be allocated in the way that they were? Um, how did that process kind of go down? Um, you know, as I as I mentioned, that that bill was a combination of regulation and uh, incentives, and so really, the you know the contention was over. Uh, uh, you know, industry was very happy about getting uh, incentives, but not so happy about having regulation. Uh, what else is new? So uh, that that's really where the contention was. You know, to what extent should we be uh, regulating uh, diesel, or should this just be an entirely uh, voluntary program with uh, incentives available? And you know, many of us uh, are arguing for a combination of the two. Thank you. Um, and now we're hitting almost the end of the hour, um, so I just wanted to go ahead and extend a final thank you to our presenters, um, Kathy, Christine. 
Kevin, Senator Dembrow, uh, we greatly appreciate the expertise each of you were able to provide. Um, and thanks, of course, to all of our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions um, that go beyond the webinar, you can see the contact information on the page in front of you. They'll also be available for download um, once the webinar is, is recorded and put live. Um, as a reminder, that recording will be made available shortly, and we will send an email link out to all participants with that included. Um, our next NRI committee webinar will be in two weeks, focusing on states um, and community solar energy policies. To register or find out more information, visit ncsl.org, or feel free to send me an email as well. Uh, it's kristen.hildreth at ncsl.org and can also be found on NCSL's homepage. Um, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you so much again, Cassie, Christine, Kevin, and Senator Denver. We really appreciate the expertise that you could provide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.